Good morning, friends. Uh, fundamental misconceptions can be applied to theosophy just like it can be applied to life. Because theosophy is the wisdom of religion, the truth about life and all of its manifestations. Uh, in all of its manifest manifestations, we have perfection as well as imperfection. All perfection and also all imperfection adhere in life itself in one form or another. Only the perfections already acquired survive as unity. on the board, that's a very important word, universal brotherhood, etc. Um, so that, that survives uh, in what is commonly known as spirit to go on. Now, we are in various stages of development, and as we go, go from life to life, we work toward acquiring more and more perfection. So just throwing that out as we continu continue through the talk. So the root, root and basis of the fur further evolution of monads, which is what we are in essence, and uh, they um, do not exist in, uh, in uh, the imperfections do not exist in spirit. Uh, they have their birth, life, and death in matter. So only the perfections go on from life to life in, 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 um, as we are monads in the spiritual world uh, after uh, between lives. That becomes the food for the unity we're talking about uh, and the basis for the law of unity. We are all one. Not only us as humans, but us as the cosmos, us as plants, animals, and mineral life, etc. It's a law. It's not something that's uh, just nice to understand and know about. We have to act in accordance with that law or we fall into misconceptions. And we are replete, we are full of misconceptions in the material world. So, conditioned existence is what matter is. When we're in matter, we're in conditioned existence. Uh, our evolution or uh, it, we, we come in contact with what is known as karma. As opposed, in the spiritual life, we are in the state of nirvana. So these two twin doctrines, karma and nirvana, uh, are not really studied the way they should be studied. In fact, here in the Western world, we hardly hear about these terms, and yet they, they are fundamental to the evolution of life. Uh, as, as expressed here in the Secret Doctrine, uh, in one sentence, it lays out for us exactly what we're trying to talk about if we think about it in, in great detail. It says on page 266 of the Secret Doctrine, the same monad will re-emerge therefrom as a still higher being on a far higher plane to recommence its cycle of perfected activity. So it brings in the idea of cycles and as we, uh, we advance through our own self-induced and self-devised efforts, we wind up on a, very, on a much higher plane of, uh, for our next coming. <coughs> so nirvana, nirvana and karma, uh, uh, they are coexistent and co-eternal. I'm writing sideways, so it's a little crooked, but it, it, you get the point. So. <coughs> They are the twin principles of union and separateness. We run into 
separateness when we are in manifested existence. Spirit and matter during manifestation, you can, we can think of it as spirit and matter. matter. So we, we, we are spiritual beings, but we are uh, encased at this, po at this point in our development in matter. So we have to deal with matter. One without one and the other, there are two uh, ends of the same spectrum, spirit and matter. We see here in the Secret Doctrine on page 277 as, as uh, HPB uh, develops this idea, mm -hmm. It is on the right comprehension of the primeval evolution of spirit matter and its real essence that the student has to depend for the further elucidation in his mind of the occult cosmogony and for the only sure clue which can guide his subsequent studies. Jim and Crickets, this is the only sure clue and we hardly ever heard of it around here. So, um, and, and, and it's clearly evident when in the laws of nature that she is right. She's do, she doesn't come out and say, believe me. She said, test it within your own inner self and see, see, see for how you perceive it. So the real essence, the, the monad, which we are, okay, the spirit matter, the substance principle, atma buddhi, uh, all names of the same kind of thing we're talking about are terms we use for the indivisible unity of life itself through all forms, states, and conditions. So the misconception of the nature of life is common to all manifested existences. While we are in bodies, whether we're humans or whatever, we, 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 we misunderstand things a lot. An exception being the Mahatmas. They have gone through this enough. They have um, applied their energies to understanding enough and helping and teaching others that they do not misconceive things even though they come into, in, into bodies. The, uh, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, all beings fall into error, that is misconceptions, at the time of birth and by reason of the delusion of the opposites. Now we, uh, the taking of one or the other of the dual phases of life for the real essence is what we're talking about with, with the opposites. Either we get involved in the spiritual side and forget about the, the material world, which is uh, not good either, uh, but most of us are so much in the materialism we hardly even think about spiritualism. So that's the, er that's the misconception that most of us are, are into now. Not till life is realized as the source of both nirvana and karma is there emancipation of the soul and this realization can only come about through contrast, which is karma. Karma is often thought of as a negative thing, but hey, it's a teaching tool. We, 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 we are thankful for karma. Misconceptions are manifestations to the individual first in others and then to himself. We can see what others are doing wrong a lot faster than we can see what we're doing wrong. But they are rooted far below the surface of our existence as human beings. Man as a monad and man as a human being are one in the same life. We, we're just car carrying through the same old life even after the so-called death. But their existence is as far asunder as nirvana and karma opposite ends of the spectrum. Man as we experience him and misconceive him, man of spirit invested with manner, with matter, is born, acts, interacts with all the hierarchies of beings, dies, enters Nevacon, so much as his li human life as represents an addition to the already acquired perfection of the monad is assimilated and that is the end of the human being. It is the monad which reemerges from Devakon as a still higher being on a far higher plane to recommence its cycle of perfected activity in a new incarnation as a new human being. Our personalities disintegrate, etc., you know, at the end of this life, etc., and we, we start out as a new person in our next life. In the Orient, 
uh, we say, well, they, they understand all this spiritual stuff. They know what karma and reincarnation is, right? Well, popular Buddhism confuses the, the monad with the human being, the real essence with the mortal manifestation. So Buddhism, in a popular sense anyway, rejects reincarnation as taught in theosophy and says that the man in dying is annihilated but throws off skandhas which later own coalesces and form a new man. Popular Hinduism believes in reincarnation, but not as theosophy teaches it. Misconceiving karma and nirvana, the orthodox Hindu believes that certain forms of karma will condemn him to transmigration. So in fear of this, in fear of being reborn as an animal, a bird, or whatever, uh, or something uh, that they, they don't want to be more reborn as. They, uh, the yogi, which is a higher level uh, Hindu, I suppose, they abstain utterly from action and thus achieve moksha, which is the soul's release from bonds of transmigration, uh, or try to achieve those kinds of things. The ordinary caste person, or the untouchable, which uh, the Hindu system created, which is our uh, getting away from the, the, the real laws of nature. Um, th those folks uh, continue to abstain from taking, but they abstain from taking on organized life and do things to try to propitiate uh, the gods, the divas, the demons, the pitars, etc., and uh, do various offerings and so forth to try to, uh, to uh, gain a f uh, far longer sojourn in, so sojourn in Devakan and perhaps maybe uh, come back with in, in a better social standing in their next life. Now, let's go to the West here. We'll talk about popular Christianity. They do, popular Christianity in, in that uh, realm, they believe in the real essence, just as theosophists uh, uh, understand the monad to be. But they conceive the real essence as being separate from nature and from man. So they therefore worship uh, this real essence as a god, as a supreme being, so they may be, be happier uh, in eternal heaven. Not seeing the one life present in everything and everywhere, the Christians, quite as logically as the Buddhists and the Hindus, uh, do not believe in inherent immortality or karma and reincarnation, which is a uh, common uh, reincarnation. Reincarnation is another word for spiritual evolution, too, on the spiritual side. But they look on spiritual evolution as a gift bestowed by their supreme being on those who have faith in him. And they uh, believe, they logically believe in Im immortality of woe inflicted by God uh, upon those who disbelieve in him and who never heard of him. So they go out and preach the gospel, etc. So, an, an, an enormous, so an ever increasing number of Western minds, which is typically where the Christians are, uh, as, a result, as a result of advancing intellectual evolution, reject uh, Orthodox Christian misconceptions and be they become spiritualist and materialist. So these spiritualists accept the idea of the one life, but confuse real essence with the human personality. They believe in the endless evolution of the human being in other spheres after the death of the mortal body. Um, spiritualists and materialists, neither one, are based on, they're, they're both based on phenomena, which is an observable factor event. If you can't observe it, then it doesn't, work, doesn't count. But the, neither the spiritualist nor the materialist has any philosophy. Materialism, as what we, we, we call it, you know, it's known as the science of the day. Um, not believing in any other evolution than physical, rejects the idea of any other real essence than, manner, than matter, cannot accept reincarnation, does not believe in the soul as the revolver, and yet, since uh, spirit has a real essence within and beyond matter, misconceives spirit and calls it law. And then they misconceive law as being blind and unconscious, unjust, or rather indifference, 
while depending absolutely on the inherency of, inerrancy of the law. So the theories and hypotheses of science are as mortal and perishable as the phenomena themselves. And uh, each new generation of scientists propounds new theories to account for the same old phenomena. Now, we are seeing the, the modern scientists come through, the Einsteins and Brian Greens of the world, that are trying to move science forward uh, into what we might call a theosophical direction. Uh, but the, the mainstream of science is still uh, in the dark ages, in this student's view, but there, there, there is, if you will, uh, in these, in the uh, uh, scientists like Einstein and Green coming forward, uh, in this student's view, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it's a very slow process, but it seems to me like they are moving in the right direction. The Theosophical stood it, uh, having seen the misconceptions in religion, science, and the phenomena of life, uh, rejects them all. It says uh, he's, he's going to go out and find the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <coughs> and in so doing, he is, uh, starts reading the secret doctrine and so forth. and is attracted by the vastness and profoundness of the wisdom religion. Something in him wakes up and responds to the great fundamental ideas of the one life, of karma, of reincarnation, of evolution, spiritual, intellectual, as well as physical. So that something tells him, hey, this is right, this is so. And then the Theosophical student sets out to achieve all these magical results and says so he's reading about. He's sure there are masters and shalas who can do all these wonderful things. All at once, if not um, mightily on guard, the hunger for truth, the yearning of spiritual aspiration is forgotten, and in comes that old uh, human nature thirst for powers, an enlarged and expanded existence in matter, uh, and not really not spirit, it's uh, the matter side, super beings, super beings and which is the first theosophical misconception. Uh, it's very liable to so delude the student that it becomes fundamental with him. So the more the stu most student studies, the more he works, <coughs> the more he applies, the further he goes astray. He, because he will not listen uh, to the voice of the silence within him. Within him. By supposing the student uh, intellectually recognizes, but let's you know, say, but supposing the student intellectually recognizes this danger, and is constantly on guard against it, will that save him? Well, not quite. Um, only in a negative way. The fact that he is not immune to temptation in this one direction may well give him pause for reflection that he may not be immune in other areas. So he will study and apply not merely to have a powerful mind, but to use this powerful mind to help others. Hey, that sounds great, mm -hmm. uh, in all relations, etc. So, but uh, as well as he, uh, he is out there promulgating and dis disseminating the theosophy he has already acquired. So that, that will reap rewards, but it will be a phenomena of spirit and uh, not of matter. The, the lame, the halt, the blind, the needy, the ever, etc., will be attracted to him, and uh, he is rich in their view. They are poor. So they will come to feed and beg and borrow and be ministered to. So now he's going to be tempted to become the guru. He will, give, uh, will he give charity and uh, of the spirit as well as the mind and the body? Or will he grow weary of the incessant demands which absorb all his energies, which interfere with his own progress? Will he grow uncharitable? Or will he forget once more and begin to pose as a guru, a teacher, to those unfortunate younger brothers and begin to play the priest? Or will he let them hear the law and turn them to the real teaching and the real teacher from which he has uh, he has developed his own inspiration. So the temptation to speak is one having authority. 
hidden behind behind the thirst for powers is is what we're situation here. Uh, the student will fall before the second gate in, in, that we see read about in the voice of this island, uh, the gate of both uh, charity and equanimity, which is a state of stability which we all should maintain. Uh, Donna and Sheila <coughs> is what is referred to in the voice, and. That those gates will be locked against them. Many, many other students in times uh, gone by who have failed here. From the first class have come the scientists, and from the second, all the religionists of every age. The one caught fast in the toils of mastery over nature, over the elementals, the other caught faster still in the coils of mastery over the minds of man. Their souls have become enslaved <coughs> in the idea of mastery over others, and they are farther, uh, much farther away from self-mastery than the humble layman, uh, uh, than the, and, and also than they were themselves at their first initial step. HPB addresses, in the voice of the silence, uh, uh, those Dedica she dedicates the voice of the silence uh, to the few. Many are called, she repeats, but few are chosen. And those few, in every case, are self-chosen. The first two fragments of the voice she addresses to those who are called. The second fragment she addresses to those who have slain or truly recognized and are struggling against the first fundamental misconception of theosophy. The third fragment is addressed only to those who have recognized and are on guard against the, the uh, and are fighting against the second as well as the first theosophical of the, mis of the theosophical misconceptions. So the few indeed, uh, to the few indeed, does the third fragment say, Prepare thyself, for thou wilt have to travel on alone. The teacher can, can but point the way. The path is one. The path is one. It's, the student hears the paths are many. The boy says the path is one. But for all, the path is one for all. The means to reach the goal must vary with the pilgrims. It depends on our state of self-development. So we're all, so we're all in, in various stages of self-development. So at that stage, the student will need a large dose of kashanti, which is patient sweet that nos can rustle, can ruffle, as is uh, pointed out in the voice of the silence. If he is to take this third step successfully, excuse me, and plan himself uh, on the path, uh, he is going to have to have a lot of patience. He will grow discouraged, unbalanced, uncharitable, impatient with others, with himself, with the teacher, and be tempted to take the law into his own hands. So we repeatedly told to beware of that little imp called impatience. It is a proving ground for all our formal study and training. So facing the so uh, at this point uh, we are not only facing we are facing more the karma of our race than our own karma because we've worked so much at trying to deal with our own karma, but we are now dealing the, uh, with the karma of the race. So these theosophical misconceptions, uh, the theosophical mis uh, the fundo ver ver fundamental verities, have been pushed back to the true root basis: human nature. He has given up religion, but the religious notion has been there all the time. He has given up faith in miracles, but the miracle notion has been there all the time. He has believed in the one life, but universal brotherhood has not vitalized him. He has sought for knowledge and powers, not to make theosophy the living power in his life. He has been trying to save and elevate himself to make a personal God out of human nature. All the time, the heresy of separateness has lurked and profited by his work and his studies. 
The person who can come to this point and calmly look at human nature in himself as he has all along looked at it in others and go back once more to study and apply the fundamental principles and never lose sight of them again is a true theosophist. He is working in matter so he will fall many times but he will he has seen for himself as monad as the fundamental uh, that he is as a reincarnating ego and has the only sure cure which can guide his subsequent studies. What will theosoph theosophical students do when they encounter theosophical misconceptions of the present message and the present messenger uh, for theosophy students? That would be HPV and William Q. Judge, her <coughs> compatriot, who stood by her side through thick and through thin, one of the few who did. Will they be true enough students to go to the source to make it their prime affair to gain clean and clear apprehension of the fundamental principles in their applications? If they do not, if they do not try to understand her soul and gaze in, in what she was trying to do and go out on a frolic of their own to try to become a preacher of themselves and disregard the teachings, uh, as so many students have done, uh, they, can, they will just repeat the world old failure of studying and applying the path of spiritual evolution in the light of human nature. We let the, hum the human nature is subs subservient to this path of spiritual evolution. We need to, to change our human nature as we're pointing these things out. So there are many the theosophical and occult uh, theosophical students and occult societies that have developed since uh, uh, HPV was on the scene and brought out this wonderful message. And they, many of them are take, have taken these paths that have just been pointed out. Each is devoted to their own inheritance uh, which is which is really um, diluting the message of HPV, uh, and they are, these inheritors are uh, considered the their what, whatever they follow. Uh, it's contradictory and inconsistent doctrines is what what's out there. Yet all are using the same terms, which causes great confusion. All these societies come into being through theosophical misconceptions of the fundamental principles and consequent misapplication. Through students who, who were sure of themselves, which of these who have become that way, who too often soon fancied themselves as a thing apart from the mass. These are called failures, is, is what uh, the uh, literature calls them, are the originators of every sect, of every creed, of every heresy, <coughs> now the same in it, now in, and this uh, form of times. It was of such that HPV once wrote in the words of an English poet. I found them blind, I taught them how to see, and now they neither know themselves nor me. Uh, there is a, I've got about two more minutes, I think, um, another uh, interesting, very, very conceptual, very um, fundamental article that uh, the student came across. It talks about us as humans in the flesh being in the twilight, uh, 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 neither in dawn nor in dusk. And it brings out these anomalies in nature, which is really only in man. Uh, uh, he's a creature of his own misconceptions of self and nature. Uh, anomalies that we create is man. God, the devil, personality, uh, beginning in life, death, it's all life, okay? Uh, all are creatures in fancy, creatures of fancy, products of man's twilight use of man's divine creative powers. He is neither asleep as in nature, which is, uh, which um, may not have, which is not developed to the point where humanity has developed, 
Uh, the, he's the sum total, uh, neither sleep, nature is the sum total of beings below the human stage, is what the student was trying to say, nor awake as are those for whom knowledge of the true self has dispersed ignorance, such as the Mahatmas. So that which all men unite, uh, which all men unite in regarding as knowledge is ignorance, misconception, man's dream of nature and of self. It says all men in, uh, are, are living in twilight. I'm just flipping on through. It does not occur to us that we are constant influences on everything and everyone uh, that affects us. It, we, we are all, not only our fellow human beings, but the world at large, everything in it, all spirit, all matter. It seldom occurs to us that, we can, that to consider nature and ourself is indissolubly one, not two. Apparent duality of self and nature is a dream. Uh, uh, it, it, it is a dream because it's one. Both nature and one's, one and ourself exist in life. They depend on life. Life does not depend on them. Uh, just to hit on one or two things more. So these two words, spirit and matter, <coughs> uh, put on the board earlier, represent the dawn and the dusk of human consciousness, the sum totals of human experience and knowledge. By the fact of death, we are compelled to surrender back to earth what we have borrowed from it. So we must give back what we have borrowed from the common mind, which we do in the spiritual side when the monad uh, goes back and assimilates uh, what they have learned uh, while they were on this earth. The fundamental misconceptions which prison us in body and in mind are symbolized in religion and science, and in their fetishes their gods named spirit and matter, which they and we misconceive as separate realities. So um, from neither science nor religion, okay, I'm just trying to put these things in context now, from neither science nor religion can we ever get the great ideas that spirit is waking life, that matter is sleeping life, and that we humans are in dreaming life, that life is one, that all is life, ever evolving, ever under the rule of law, which is inherent in the whole. So these basic misconceptions from which all other misconceptions arise, the shadow, each man's idea of self bound up with his idea of other selves and of nature and large creates our actions. So the key to getting the correct, the correct action is understanding ourselves, which we are one with nature. From these three misconceptions, self, other selves, nature at large, Three fundamental ideas proceed in orderly sequence, uh, all our actions all on others and our reactions to others. So philosophy is crit critically important, understanding the fundamentals. So the masters of wisdoms have become what they are, remain what they are, because their fundamental conception is that of the unity of all in nature, including ourselves. Universal brotherhood is a practice, is a practical application of the idea that self is one and not many. Thank you. We're open for discussion.